uh, and uh, welcome uh, for uh, joining us here at the uh, series of events of the 2020-2021 North American Colloquium on Climate Policy. Uh, thanks very much uh, for being here. This is the second of three web events uh, marking the release of eight reports on the topic of North American climate policy. Uh, I'm Heather Miller. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of political science at the University of New Brunswick. And I'll be moderating today's event on the topic of green bilateralism and methane policy. Now, as many of you may know, uh, the North American Colloquium is a collaborative venture uh, between the University of Michigan's Ford School of Public Policy, specifically its International Policy Center, the University of Toronto, and the Autonomous National University of Mexico. And uh, this colloquium was established in 2018. And what it does is it brings together leading academic analysts and practitioners from Mexico, Canada, and the United States to address key public uh, policy issues facing all three countries. And last year's issue was climate change. And so these events and reports on the topic are really a culmination uh, of this year long focus uh, on North American climate policy. Uh, and it's also been made possible by the very generous support of the Meany Family Foundation uh, for which, uh, whose support we're very grateful. Uh, so today's event uh, will be, we'll have about an hour of a run time. It will focus on three reports um, that I'm delighted uh, to be moderating. Uh, so there's first is Canada-US Green Bilateralism Targeting Cooperation for Climate Mitigation by Deborah Van Knighton and Mark McGuinney. Um, and the second one, sorry, they're from uh, Wilfrid Laurier University and Carleton University, uh, respectively. The second paper that we'll hear about today is Methane, Methane Politics and Policy in North America by Barry Ray from the University of Michigan. And finally, we'll finish up uh, with The Dark Course of Climate Change, Agricultural Methane Governance in the United States and Canada by Patricia Fisher, also of the University of Michigan. So I've uh, had the great fortune to listen to some of these early presentations and lead, er, uh, sorry, read earlier versions of these reports as they developed. And uh, I really commend all of the authors on their insightful research and analysis uh, and the creation of these reports that really provide an excellent, excellent contribution to our understanding um, of climate politics uh, in North America and particularly uh, focused on short-lived uh, climate pollutants. And so to set our stage for our discussions, uh, I'm just going to take a minute or two to highlight some uh, main themes that I see saw as I reread these reports uh, and, and just to draw through to sort of have you thinking about these uh, as we go forward with the presentations. So first, um, what I'd like to say is that these reports really provide a compelling examination of, as Trish calls them, the dark horses of climate change. Um, these are uh, an area of focusing on the elements of GHG emissions and related policy instruments, which really uh, have been until very recently um, out of the public eye Per, as compared to, you know, the, the sort of high profile topics of carbon pricing, for example. These are areas that have often been understudied by climate social scientists who are more focused on carbon pricing and renewable energy procurement. Um, but these reports really demonstrate just how crucial uh, figuring out the politics and the, the, of the policymaking of these areas will be to achieving deep decarbonization. Um, and so in particular, methane forms a common thread through all these reports, as I said, um, but these reports other always also touch on discussions of other short-lived climate pollutants. And together, they really provide an invaluable primer uh, on why these pollutants are such a problem for climate, why they're often neglected, and why some are more likely to be politically feasible than others. Second, the other sort of theme that I'd like to draw out is that these papers really pay a close attention to the intersecting threads of governance 
between international agreements, bilateral cooperation, and national and subnational climate policy. And the authors of these reports demonstrate these opportunities, but also the shortcomings of high profile international agreements. Because in many cases, even when political leadership is present, climate policy is constrained. And, and we'll get into that um, in our conversation, I think, today. And finally, um, as of the earlier papers in, released in the series, for those of you who are able to attend the earlier event, um, these papers really touch on the importance of the politics of natural gas, whether it's shale gas or liquefied natural gas or renewable natural gas, otherwise known as biomethane. And as we all know, the geopolitics of natural gas markets are, are just rapidly flux uh, with the Russian-Ukraine war. But I think that these papers demonstrate the ways in which the production, distribution, distribution and use of natural gas in North America has really already been rapidly shifting and changing over the last decades and has even changed just during the research of these reports and, and the timeliness of these reports is incredibly uh, important. And so the work of these authors really reminds us that while the particular current of configuration of events may seem utterly new, uh, in many cases today's energy politics are, are deeply rooted in past policies and past climate governance arrangements. Um, so with those uh, thoughts, uh, I would like to pass the floor uh, over to Deb and Mark. Okay. All right. So um, I want to uh, just provide a little bit of an overview of, of what we were trying to do in our paper and then um, and a few main takeaways. And then I'm going to hand it over to Mark to talk about some of the case studies. So in our paper, what we really try to do is assess where it makes most sense for Canada and the U.S. to cooperate on climate policy. And we talk a little bit about how it should be done and how it is being done. So first, what we did is we looked across sort of all of the climate policy and programming in the two countries. And, and we look at where there's the closest policy alignment. And then this leads us to a focus on three cases, the carbon capture and storage technologies, the reduction of short-lived climate pollutants, uh, and then electrification of transport. And our focus is really on, on uh, electric vehicles passenger vehicles. And so then what we do with those three cases is we dig a bit deeper and we assess bilateral cooperation in those areas according to a set of uh, seven attributes that we think really should typify good, you know, effective bilateral cooperation. Things like high levels of political commitment, the presence of strategic domestic partners that can help you achieve your agenda, legislative or regulatory framework supporting action, and you know things like whether bilateral relations are already firmly uh, institutionalized. So is there an architecture there? And there's, there's three kind of takeaways from our partner, uh, from our paper. Um, the first is that, you know, there's no doubt that a, a coordinated and ambitious cross-border climate policy strategy is needed in North America, right? We don't, we don't simply want to push greenhouse gases around the continent, we wanna reduce them. And we need to make every effort to capitalize on what are very close economic and trade ties. And um, you know, we wanna make sure that North America uses its combined forces to secure a place in the global race for market share and clean tech because we are definitely in a global race, right? But that's not what we have in place currently. Right? There is no ambitious cross-border climate policy strategy with, you know, with a coherent vision. So under the Biden and Trudeau administrations, the architecture supporting bilateral cooperation is lightweight. It's not well institutionalized. It's functionally intense or, or, or functionally intense, and it's not particularly cohesive. So what we see across our chosen areas is that bilateral cooperation takes place via a pretty broad array of distinctive cooperative channels and structures that are kind of loosely gathered under an executive umbrella, right? And, and you know, what we find is this really fragments continental uh, policy efforts. The second takeaway is, is a really political one. And that is while the political will to take ambition, uh, ambitious action related to greenhouse gas mitigation and a green transition is, is readily available on both sides of the border. Like this is, a, this is a great moment in time 
for the two countries to be cooperating. Um, the bilateral infrastructure is really vulnerable to domestic political headwinds, but those, but but they're not equally vulnerable. And so, what something that I think Mark and I want to draw out in the discussion today is that, you know, if you look across the next two three years, uh, what's left in the mandates of of the two administrations, um, what you see is that domestic politics and opposition are strong are stronger constraint in the US case than in Canada across all of our, uh, all the cases that we look at, right? And in fact, in Canada, I'm gonna, you know, sort of controversial make, controversially make the argument that national climate policy um, has become somewhat less vulnerable to opposition from the provinces and large industries. So we can talk about that. And then the third kind of takeaway is that certainly in the cases of carbon capture storage and EVs, right, Canada and the US could and should be adopting what Mark and I talk about as a cluster strategy for pursuing uh, continental climate cooperation, but they failed to do so thus far. Short-lived climate pollutants, um, they work less well in a cluster format. We can talk about that as well. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it over to Mark because he's been thinking more about how you make, you know, sort of how you cluster policy strategies in these three cases. Thanks, Deborah. Um, yeah, so one of the one of the key issues that we wanted to define with with this paper is is not only how you uh, go about clustering, but how do you choose uh, particular policy areas that uh, you know have tendencies that may differ from one another, but also can show you how the bilateral cooperative processes may or may not be actually playing out within the domain. So as Deborah indicated, uh, short-lived climate, pol uh, climate pollutants are interesting because they don't necessarily lend well to a clustered format, yet they have uh, the longest history as far as uh, like formal bilateral regulatory approaches are concerned. So whether you go back to the Canada-US Air Quality Agreement or the Net Zero Producers Forum or the Expert Working Group on Black Carbon and Methane, these are uh, domains and jurisdictions where there has been significant uh, discussion between Canada and the US. And it seems that efforts have not necessarily fallen off, but they may have fallen short uh, compared to what it is that we wanted to see. So taking the form of, you know, uh, ministerials in, in joint statements, but not actually getting together uh, within, you know, uh, forum discussions and, you know, putting your heads together in a, in a manner that is uh, both constructive and, you know, cooperative. So uh, SLCPs, we'd say uh, we chose them on the characterization that uh, you do have this established you know, regulatory working relationship, but it may not be being explored to its uh, fullest potential. If we turn to uh, vehicle electrification or just electrification in general, uh, the domain itself is interesting because it's characterized by both, uh, you know, cooperation and competitiveness. So we're concerned with vehicle electric uh, electrification within the entire uh, life cycle of, uh, you know, the transition to EV. So starting with critical minerals, and then we're looking at vehicle manufacture, battery manufacture, recycling, charging infrastructure, uh, as, as the kind of the four key or four or five, uh, including critical mineral strategies that need to sort of be built out um, in an integrated fashion. Uh, but it doesn't seem to be uh, the case for this industry thus far. And uh, we think that that stems from, uh, you know, that the competitive, the, the competitiveness of uh, the industry itself and uh, the desire for a number of key actors and players to be leveraging or attempting to leverage uh, comparative advantage within the domain itself. Um, we certainly understand why this might be the case, but we also question uh, whether or not 
the industry itself can be deployed in a more constructive fashion if we have you know more cooperation on the table you know if we, if we stick to these discussions at uh, high level ministerials and and little uh, you know, statements here and there are we actually talking about uh, cooperation or are uh, the two countries running in parallel with each other we want to find that point of intersection where intersection is uh, constructive and for the benefit of of both parties and there are little items that we can pick out uh out of you know each aspect of that quad factor plus critical minerals and we we want to keep critical minerals in the conversation because the united states has uh, said on multiple occasions that uh, they need to enter into some sort of dependency agreement for their supply of critical minerals uh, and in Canada is, is certainly well positioned uh, to fulfill that need, but it's going to take an amount of cooperation uh, for that to unfold in, in a constructive fashion. Uh, CCS, on the other hand, is uh, characterized by, uh, you know, some infrastructure in place and uh, some uh, prior uh, development and developmental cooperation in place uh, as far as uh, Weyburn Midale or uh, uh, regional characterization through the PCOR partnership, uh, but it's kind of fallen off uh, the map and we have uh, private actors uh, taking the steps further in their own regard, but we're not seeing uh, much commitment on the, the national or the international uh, level. We, we know that uh, enhanced oil recovery has uh, certainly made uh, the conversation around carbon capture and storage a little bit difficult. Um, but it is still an area where we see promise uh, for cooperation. And uh, if we think about CCS in the form of uh, hub source and sync networks, uh, then there's a, a number of, of avenues for entrance for, for interested parties. Uh, very much, uh, Mark and Deborah, you've given us a lot to think about. Uh, and we'll move on to Barry, who's going to talk uh, about uh, methane in North America. Thanks so much, Heather. Um, we all know that addressing carbon emissions are a really hard political slog, whether we're in Canada, the United States, Mexico, anywhere in the world to devise policies that have a strong base of political support and create policies that are durable and really drive down carbon emissions is tough to do regardless of sector. One thing, and Heather, you said it very nicely at the outset that really kind of links across our papers is that in varying ways, each has a focus on the question of short lived climate pollutants. And this is really an area where our natural and physical science colleagues have done most of the lifting and the social sciences have been relatively late to the table to think about those. But at least in each of these papers, certainly a major focus of mine is the question that when the climate impacts are intensely front loaded, they become near term climate impacts, which is true for methane, hydrofluorocarbons, black carbon and the other short lived climate pollutants. Does that shift or change the politics? Because you can argue and perceive that there's a near term or shorter term benefit, as opposed to the discussions we often have in carbon where we're discussing about generations or many, many decades where there might be some benefit to tilling. Does that change the politics? And in that sense, the case that I'm examining, CH4 or methane in the energy sector, particularly oil and gas production, should be a pretty easy case to make an argument for extensive political engagement. A ton of methane has 87 times the global warming capacity of a similar amount of carbon during its first two decades in the atmosphere, consistent with these other pollutants. Methane from oil and gas is the waste of a non-renewable natural resource that if captured is in effect gas and has considerable commercial value. There's money being lost all over the place of sloppy oil and gas operations. Methane is clearly an air toxic in many respects, depending on the venting and flaring combinations that are in play and falls directly into the orbit of air quality and air protection. 
There are also models, corporations that have found it relatively easy for some time to minimize methane releases. In the European context, Norway, in the Middle Eastern context, Saudi Arabia, who actually had enviable methane reduction captured records in some cases for decades or in Norway's cases, generations. There was an IEA study that came out uh, two months ago that said if the entire world were to adopt Norway's longstanding standards for oil and gas related to methane, we would achieve more than a 90% reduction in energy sector methane. And then there's this phrase, low hanging fruit, which I'm reluctant to use because it's almost always trundled out in discussions of methane. And so here I go. The reality that for this kind of methane release, the technologies to capture or to mitigate, to reduce those emissions are really quite stunning. Many of them have been around for some time. And many of them are very cost effective, especially when you weigh in the, the gas capture and economic use of the gas. And yet, when we turn to methane across North America historically, but most oil and gas producing states around the world, there's the politics of which there's very, very, literate, very little literature. And collectively, we're all making contributions to thinking about some of these issues with these, with these papers. So I was focusing on these three neighboring petro states, Mexico, Canada, and the United States, especially in very highly decentralized regimes like Canada and the United States, where you have your Texas's and Alberta's that are given enormous flexibility and latitude to design their own policies in those systems. And my research focus is an area of rather soft continental policy agreement a 2016 North American Leader Summit, not the first, not the last, which agreed among the three leaders of North America at that time to achieve deep energy sector methane reductions by the middle of this decade. And much of the paper takes the story across those three cases. What happens when continental leaders come together and sign a formal agreement? Mexico actually followed fairly promptly and passed legislation that gained accolades from groups like the Environmental Defense Fund, state-of-the-art methane legislation. It's still on the books. By all accounts, it has not been implemented. Mexico, especially under the energy, the oil renationalization under the current government, has the remarkable and staggering record of producing less oil, much more methane, and now having to increase its imports of gas from Texas via pipeline to compensate for flared losses of gas that it's producing on its own. In the US, the US ultimately from 2016 shirked. We had one administration, the Trump administration, reverse efforts by the Obama administration to create a regulatory regime through unilateral executive action. We had aggressive opposition from almost all at that time, production states to any federal activity or initiative no history of serious congressional engagement, and very uneven performance across states and firms in this area. The exceptional case here is Canada. The Trudeau government, really even before the summit was moving to develop a more credible methane regime, model on some best practices, has moved to implement that and is actually essentially on track to meet its mid-decade 2025 emission reduction targets three nations, three very different paths. Uh, and Heather, you've referred to this at the outset. One thing that really kind of struck me in my paper is that I thought I was done with this paper about a year ago, first draft. And then like policy happened and politics began to shift. And I don't mean to suggest like, you know, glacial, great glacial tectonic shifts. And yet, if you look at certainly the American case, energy sector methane has really begun to move over the last 13 or 14 months, another change of administrations. And I don't quite a bit of time toward the very end of the paper over kind of a meditation on what this means. In the US, since January of 2021, the first time Congress acted using the Congressional Review Act to overturn the Trump administration, actually some Republican support, primarily Democrats, uh, restoring the Obama era, regulations through legislation, not regulation, giving EPA and federal agencies a chance to kind of build on that record. We've begun to see a small set of 
production states, particularly Colorado and New Mexico, our second largest oil producer now after Texas, developing pretty aggressive regulatory programs to capture methane on their own, growing shifts and divides between varying types of oil and gas producer industries. It is no longer the uniform coalition that would be opposed to every possible methane proposal at a state capital. And then we have things like the new North American Leaders Pledge, which is now five months old. They're back together again, a different group, and now they've doubled down on the earlier pledge. They've changed the language, but we now have a new North American agreement, uh, as well as a global provision, the ultimate in international soft law, the Global Methane Pledge. 110 nations have joined President Biden's challenge to try to achieve a 30% reduction in all of methane through 2030. We'll see how that goes. 110 nations are on board. Really, to this point, only Canada has stepped forward and said, we're not only pledging it, but here's how we're going to do it. That said, all of this is very uncertain. It is very fragile. And any of these late pivots should not be suggesting that we are well on our way to a very clear and effective methane regime. And yet, we're in a very different place than the first time I actually presented some version of this to my team, to, to my colleagues here, but then, but then others. And it has made me wonder if you combine this with what we're seeing in the hydrofluorocarbons area in the US, but the other countries, if there are some ways that we can begin to think about uh, a North American leadership role in, in these areas. Mindful though, as Deb, you've pointed out, the clustering and aligning these different nations becomes a, a huge, huge challenge. So some initial thoughts, thanks. Thanks, Jerry. And, and uh, we'll move on to Trish uh, Fisher and uh, the politics uh, of agricultural methane. Thanks, Heather. I'm delighted to be here with you all today and to be a part of this colloquium. Um, I'd particularly like to thank Barry for his ongoing me mentorship um, Heather and Marcelo Lopez Vallejo for their very thoughtful feedback, and Josh for all of his hard work um, in putting on this colloquium. While I've been interested in the role of livestock in the climate crisis since before I started graduate school, it was not till my first year at the Ford School that I learned just how underexamined from a policy perspective livestock and agricultural methane were, especially in North America. During the last year and a half, as I've been researching agricultural methane policy under Barry's tutelage, uh, there has been a pretty seismic shift in the global climate policy arena, as Barry alluded to, um, with methane moving from relative obscurity to center stage. Despite this unprecedented level of attention on methane, livestock agriculture, which is one of the largest sources of methane emissions globally, simply has not received the same level of attention from climate policy scholars or policymakers. So my paper is an attempt to begin filling that gap by examining the federal and sub-federal approaches to agricultural methane mitigation in the US and Canada. These two countries represent particularly important cases for agricultural methane governance. Both represent small shares of the global population, but are two of the world's largest producers, consumers, and exporters of livestock and animal source food products. As such, the US and Canada bear disproportionate responsibility for global livestock methane emissions, which are estimated to comprise roughly 6% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this issue has become all the more urgent because in the last few years, climate research has demonstrated that even if global combustion of fossil fuels were to cease immediately, emissions from the global food system alone would preclude 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming and threaten the preclusion of two degrees Celsius of warming by 2100. So given that roughly half of emissions from the global food system stem from livestock production, emissions from livestock agriculture have become the so-called dark horse of climate change. My paper's key finding is that neither Canada nor the US are considering policy approaches that even approximate the types of comprehensive changes to the food system 
that will be necessary to avert more than two degrees of warming. To date, the U.S. has focused almost entirely on addressing the small fraction of livestock methane emissions that result from the decomposition of livestock waste. Um, this has primarily been done by subsidizing and incentivizing extraordinarily expensive biogas recovery systems, which can generate electricity or renewable natural gas from livestock waste. However, these policies do nothing to address the source of the vast majority of livestock methane emissions, enteric fermentation, which is a natural and essential part of ruminant livestock's digestive systems. So Canada, on the other hand, has focused on the demand side um, by recommending reduced consumption of red meat and dairy products, which has, in some ways, put it ahead of the U.S. Canada has not pursued any additional policies, for example, a meat tax, uh, that would actually put teeth behind these dietary recommendations and begin to draw down livestock production. So for the sake of brevity, I'd be happy to discuss some of the science of livestock methane mitigation, as well as state and provincial strategies uh, during the Q&A. Uh, so the US and Canada are beginning to fall behind peer countries in terms of livestock methane. Um, for instance, Ireland, the Netherlands, and New Zealand have enacted or are considering far more aggressive approaches to livestock methane mitigation, such as mandatory cuts in livestock production and inclusion of em agricultural emissions in New Zealand's greenhouse gas pricing scheme. So in conclusion, I hope um, that by detailing the American and Canadian approaches to agricultural methane governance, um, my paper will contribute to a small but growing body of research that demonstrates the gap between what is currently being done and the scale of approaches necessary to avert the most catastrophic climate scenarios. There are enormous political barriers ranging from powerful vested interests to voters' dietary preferences that have rendered this such a difficult aspect of the climate crisis to address. We know what needs to be done. Uh, countries in the global north, but particularly the US, given the outsized global influence of American agricultural policy, must transition away from red meat and dairy consumption. However, it remains an open question whether we will muster the political will to effectively address this large and growing source of methane emissions. And with that, I will turn it over back over to Heather. Thanks, Trish. Uh, thanks, everybody, uh, for, for those uh, encapsulations. Uh, I'll just uh, let everybody who's on the call know uh, that the papers are just currently in press. They're coming out very soon. And so everyone who's uh, here today, will we can email you a link to the copy of the papers. I really, really encourage you uh, to read them. They're, they're just a Excellent. Um, and uh, I think so. What I'll do to kick us off uh, for a little bit of questions, a little bit of conversation for about 10 minutes, and then we'll open up the floor uh, for convert for questions. Um, just in the interest of time, what I'll ask you to do is to just type your question into the chat so we can, uh, you can either, you're welcome to just direct message me, Heather Miller, uh, or you can just share it with everyone. And then we'll try to uh, sort of cluster those questions um, towards uh, in about 10 minutes. But um, to start us off, what I'd like to do is to just pick up on those domestic headwinds uh, that Deborah was talking about. Um, what struck me, and I know it's my own confirmation bias because I study subnational climate policy, uh, but really the role of these uh, subnational governments as both leaders and laggards uh, in driving uh, momentum around some of these areas, particularly around uh, CCS and the electrification of transport, but also um, those production states and agricultural uh, equivalent uh, in, in Trisha's case. So encouraging uh, anyone to jump in and, and just tell us a little bit more about what your findings were. 
Well, uh, you know what? I'll start us off um, and, and try to be controversial. So when we when we think about Canada, the U.S., and Mexico is you know it's a different federal system, but you know certainly in in Canada, the U.S., the provinces and states have the power to just obstruct, 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 and they're very effective at doing so. On the other hand, we have those that lead. We have those subnational unit provinces and states that lead. And we also have some good Mexican examples of states that try to lead, right? Um, I would say what's interesting right now is that in Canada, the, the leaders, the provinces that are leader, leaders are being enabled. And the ones that are obstructionists are, are being weighed down by the, you know, these layers of federal policies that are being put in place successively. You know, I would say from the pan-Canadian framework to the Supreme Court decision that the feds have precedence in climate policy, and then these layers of legis greenhouse gas emissions accountability act, we've got the emissions reduction plan now, we've got methane regulations, and then, you know, they're going to cap oil and gas. So I would say that those provinces that want to be obstructionist and have long been obstructionists are finding that they can't get purchase in the same way anymore. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to the others um, to talk about whether that they see anything like that happening in the US. So Deb, I'd like to pick up on the first part of your comment, the leader and laggard divide. And we see that big time across the climate space in the US. What makes methane, though, probably even more complicated than carbon is that there's probably great political will to move on methane among the many states that don't produce oil and gas. And many of them don't have large manufacturing sectors, don't use a lot of gas. The closer you get to points of actual production in states, the political will to address methane declines dramatically. If you look at the 15 large production states, which are the, mainly the jurisdictions that I look at in, 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 in my paper. And here you also see how incredibly hyper-partisan and divisive methane policy has been amongst states more generally as well. The, the Republican democratic divide, which wasn't really true in the first decade of the century, but has been there ever since. Almost all of those states are pure Republican states. Politically, it would probably be very hard for anyone to survive, certainly statewide, emphasizing a particular methane strategy or the like. And where we do begin to see some states starting to push the edge, I mentioned Colorado and, and New Mexico, are states that kind of flip the script and are all democratic usually start with a governor kind of pushing the edge, legislative pickup, but those are still the minority of production states in the US. And so if you look at just those states of one party, they're, they're methane policy leaders, they're constantly moving. The rest of the pack still would have to be dragged, kicking and screaming. One last point is I think we really do see in this area, the ability of states, not just to kind of push new policy, but block and actively try to undermine everything that the federal government might try to do. And a real challenge for what the Biden is trying to do through executive action is a lot of that is still going to have to be run through interstate negotiations under the Clean Air Act. State implementations and procedures that could take years to put something into play. And so we may see that script repeat itself. So some thoughts from the energy sector. Yeah, and I would just add very briefly um, that federalism poses an enormous challenge um, for livestock methane mitigation because livestock agriculture it ex exists and is mostly viable in every American state and Canadian province. So, you know, livestock agriculture is a highly mobile source of emissions. Livestock are, are typically already shipped over very long di differences, distances. Um, so this, this is a real challenge of when states want to take more serious action, um, they are basically just ensuring that their livestock industry is going to move to another state or province. Um, so in, in livestock agriculture, you know, by far um, the case that is the most, um, has developed the most comprehensive approach to mitigation is California and their uh, signature livestock policy um, specifically states that the most one of the most overriding objectives is minimizing leakage to other countries and other states. So 
Uh, it's a real challenge at the subfederal level, but there has been some action, notably in California and Alberta in Canada. Thank you, everybody. That that raises the, the the other thought that I had that I was really curious about, which is the role of uh, technical or uh, technological uncertainty versus uh, political. Uh, viability or feasibility uh, of the, these policies. And uh, one thing, uh, Deborah and Mark, I just want to reiterate for our audience uh, just how comprehensive uh, the work is with regard to measures and really that I really appreciate this combination of conversation about technological readiness as well uh, as the sort of uh, the, the governance structures that are there. And I'm wondering if uh, in your work, you talk about the tension between CCS still being as yet un commercially unproven, but politically viable. Whereas Trish, your work really highlights the extreme unproven nature of any kind of supply side policy solutions for methane mitigation. Whereas Barry, your work's almost, you know, it's the other side, it's sort of technologically, we know what to do. It's it, it's just not there. So I won't, I'm wondering if you might talk, uh, if anyone has any thoughts about the sort of role of, of both technological, but also political uncertainty in your research hmm. and the way that they interact. I mean, I, I guess I can start that off from uh, the, the technological side at least, and because you, you brought up carbon capture, it, it is an interesting uh, domain to kind of begin with. One of the big issues with carbon capture is of course that it is prohibitively, at this point in time, prohibitively expensive. And uh, we're, we're trying to, uh, you know, understand that there is the direct air capture route, which is uh, uh, of course the you know, most promising application of carbon capture because it has the ability to actually generate negative emissions. Uh, the problem with that of course, is that pulling uh, carbon directly out of uh, the atmosphere in, in any CCS conversation is at the bottom of the, the, the feasibility uh, chain. Uh, it, it just is uh, too expensive. We do have, you know, uh, big private sector players like looking into um, this issue. But at this point in time, we need to think about carbon capture uh, and, and sequestration, usually through, uh, you know, the, the oil and gas uh, channels. Uh, with, with that being said, the conversation then turns to what are you actually doing when uh, you sequester carbon and whether or not you are using that uh, sequestered carbon for the purposes of uh, enhanced oil recovery. And one of the, the big hindrances for CCS really taking off is a concern that stems from EOR because EOR pushes the emissions somewhere down the road. Yes, you are taking uh, uh, you know, carbon and, and recycling it as part of the process, but that those fossil fuels are still going to be burned uh, somewhere down the line. So thinking about uh, uh, downstream uh, emissions certainly, uh, you know, scares people a little bit on EOR and the pushback in the Canadian context has been big on that. We just had a, a big letter from uh, uh, over 400 concerned scientists in Canada uh, because the Canadian government is, is, is currently proposing or just had a consultation period on how they would structure a, a tax credit for carbon capture purposes. And the resounding consensus was that if this is going to happen and if we facilitate this credit, uh, we do not want to see it going towards um, EOR. But at the same time, you still want to be able to leverage the industry itself. You want to create economies of scale within the industry. So it, I think it is a, a, a bit of a balancing act, at least on that technological side. But as we see the technology kind of proliferate into uh, different industries and, and methane is, is certainly a big one, which I think that, uh, that, that Barry can speak to, uh, I, I, I wouldn't call it off the table. It's we need to you know, encourage and facilitate the investment so that we can you know, uh, downsize on the, on the side of cost and then increase on the, on the side of efficiency. So if I could pick up on that, you know, Heather, you framed the methane point in your great question that technologically we seem to know what to do about it. And yet there's a flip side to that. Technically, we actually don't know how much methane is being produced from site to site, state to state, province to province. I mean, we're like way off 
And unlike most of the other climate contaminants, certainly carbon, but others, we don't have reliable data. One of the themes that I explore in the paper is this sort of irony where we have all this capture technology and all the rest, but it's only belatedly that we're beginning to develop a recognition that the reporting systems that have been placed, which are largely industry driven, exhibit an extraordinary downward bias. And a broad rule of thumb across a large, large number of studies is that a lot of posted data is off by 40 to 70 percent. You know, imagine if we were having this conversation about greenhouse gas emissions from a power plant. Well, we're not sure. This is really, really challenging, and yet it's also one where I think the natural and physical sciences that have focused on monitoring and satellite and over, overflight issues have really brought much, much more attention, at least to energy sector methane than perhaps livestock, agriculture, and some of these other areas. And there could be some really significant advancements if we get those numbers right, in part because of the bad news, the numbers are going to be much, much higher than anyone wanted to believe five or 10 years ago when natural gas seemed a much more attractive alternative to coal than it is now. So I think for livestock, there, there are some parallels with energy sector methane, which is that we really have no idea how, how much methane emissions are coming from livestock and particularly from livestock waste. Um, so there's been um, recent studies have demonstrated that there's just this enormous gap between um, bottom up estimates from livestock waste and like when they actually deploy that are doing aerial surveillance technology and we're talking about orders of magnitude difference in, in the estimate in the estimates so um, the numbers that are typically cited in the literature are probably way way off and um, in terms of what the future um, of technology is going to look like in livestock methane mitigation um, I think it's going to come down to um, how fast the FDA and similar bodies globally are going to be able to approve um, drugs, vaccines, and genetically engineered animals um, to decrease their methane emissions. So there, there have been genetically engineered cattle already approved by the F FDA to be heat tolerant. So I think like that's where we're going in the future. Um, but there's obviously this sort of enormous question about the consumer acceptance and, and potential health implications like on animal health and subsequently human health of what you know genetically engineered cattle means. I think I'm going to move on to some questions uh, from the audience. I'm going to uh, ask one for each of the presenters uh, just to get them out there and have you a chance to think about them. So uh, first uh, for uh, Deborah and Mark um, from Christopher Park, uh, there are inherently different incentives for cooperation on a policy option. Are there, sorry, inherently different incentives for cooperation on a policy option like CCS um, to an area like electrification? And if so, are there some areas in particular that you really want to um, push with regard or that you found uh, with regards to low hanging fruit in terms of North American cooperation? Um, for Barry, uh, looking at the, the different paths between Canada, the US and Mexico, um, what kind of uh, variation do you see across the cases, with, with particularly with regards to interest group mobilization or relative costs or differences in constituencies that might benefit from these more stringent regulations uh, like those found in other parts of the world? And that's um, from Eric LaChapelle. Uh, and as well uh, for uh, Trish, if, if, just to give you an opportunity, you talked a, a bit about this, the comprehensive work in your paper about supply side or uh, supply side measures. I'm just wondering if you want to talk a little bit more about demand side policies and, and what some of those might look like uh, from, from, your other, um, the, from your other cases that you look at in the paper. Um, and I, I, I guess maybe Deborah and Mark, if you are willing to go first. Sure. Well, you know, that's a really hard question, Christopher. <laughs> you know, low hanging fruit. I feel, you know, my 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 um my beaten down side, you know, having studied climate policy for 25 years, is saying we've done low hanging fruit, like it's gone, right? <laughs> so, you know, we, we have to make we have to do the hard stuff now. 
That said, um, two quick thoughts. The low hanging fruit is energy efficiency, right? Which we could be doing, you know, Mark and I started looking at that. That's not something that we, we went, we dug into in the paper. That is the low hanging fruit. And in the North American context, we could be doing a lot more. And there's infrastructure there. Um, you know, the NAFTA committees or the, the you know, CUSMA uh, USMCA committees that are, 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 are you know, focusing on, on standards harmonization could be doing that up the wazoo, right? And, you know, as far as I know, they're not doing that. But I, like, I think EVs are just an open and shut case. Who else is going to compete with China in terms of manufacture of batteries, manufacture of cars, the critical minerals to create all of this, plus battery recycling, which we need to talk more about battery recycling. That's an area that is under kind of provisioned globally. North America could be, North America could be the battery recycling kind of center right? But all of those components that Mark and I talk about, we talk about like the EV quadfecta, right? Trifecta is a, a horse bet that you put in, we call it the, the quadfecta, right? You know, we could be organizing this on a continental scale to compete, and we're not. We're not doing that. And, you know, Mark and I are just like, why? We keep having these discussions about, this makes so much sense. And, and you know, Canada should be playing hardball and saying, we got the critical minerals, but we're not going to give them unless we're doing this, this, and the other thing. So let's let's play ball, and we did, we don't see that happening. Mary, so, you, yeah. yeah, thanks, and uh, thanks, Eric, for the question. I think this question of playing ball is a really interesting one, Deb, and in part, I think one of the questions that I've been posing a lot over our project is: should we really think about trilateralism in the full continent, or do we look for targets of opportunities when at least two of the three nations are aligning in similar ways, given the history and the challenges in doing some of this? And how do you sort of play off these differences? That's one observation. Relatedly, and we just mentioned the US-Mexico-Canada uh, trade agreement, replacing the NAFTA agreement, put together in the last stages of the Trump administration. Um, is an interesting one to weigh and think about because it might, it could have theoretically built on what NAFTA began in some of the environmental space. It largely did not. USMCA has had some great advances, it's advances continentally in digital governance, labor policy. It was support, supported by a lot of Republicans and Democrats through the, the approval process in, in, in Congress. Um, and yet that whole continental question, could you come back through the amendment process or the fact that USMCA has to be revised, I believe every six, reviewed every six years, could you bring in some of this content into that? Is that an arena to play ball? If you did, what would be that sweeter subset of policies? One last point is that we really haven't talked about this much in, in our discussions, but I think is significant, is thinking about how different the three nations are in terms of carbon pricing. As Canada moves toward end of the decade toward a $170 a ton carbon price, Canadian currency bought a huge new price. The Mexican carbon price is at about $1 converted to US with exemptions for natural gas. And the US carbon price, as best as I can see, is going to remain at zero. With the possibility that the European Union is going to launch a process known as carbon border adjustment trade wars, tariffs, and all the rest, is North America going to align and work against or work with Europe? And what happens when we have this sort of interesting cross-border dynamic when you cross over where I live, the Ambassador Bridge, and you move from a carbon-free tax zone to one of the largest carbon prices in the world? How do we think about all of those pieces is that cuts across whether we're looking at methane or some of these other areas? And I think that's some of the the, the underlying policy for which I'm not at all sure there's a good institutional design yet. Thanks, Mary. Uh, and Trish, I want to leave it uh, with you to, to it's just tell us more about those uh, demand side policies, if you want. Yeah. So uh, in 2019, um, Canada rolled out um, 
new dietary guidelines, um, which really emphasize the need to transition away from mammalian protein and towards mostly plant-based sources of protein. Um, and these dietary guidelines have been heralded by all different kinds of environmental organizations as sort of sample sustainable nutrition guidelines. Um, so I think there's definitely something there, um, but there's a study out of the OECD that has shown that red meat consumption is not going to change um, in Canada without some sort of market intervention. So uh, there's a pretty substantial literature in public health that sort of demonstrates that dietary guidelines only do so much, like they're, they're good, but they're, they don't really move the needle all that much. Um, there, this is really um, like a very small and emerging field of research, so there's not a lot there there. Uh, but I will say um, that a host of European countries have implemented these same kinds of dietary guidelines that really specify that you should be eating almost no red meat whatsoever. Um, countries, including Australia and the UK, have considered meat taxes, but none have been implemented, um, with the exception of, I think, Hungary, which has sort of a broader junk food tax, um, which I think like hamburgers and things like that, like qualify in the junk food tax. Um, and then lastly, uh, this is being rolled out across the EU and there's just constant battles by different countries with large beef, pork and cheese um, industries. Um, but the EU has a system called NutriScore, um, which puts like a red, yellow, green label uh, on food packaging that indicates sort of the health and sustainability impl impl implications of your food choices. Um, so luckily, um, sustainable diets and healthy diets like pretty much overlap entirely. So it's a pretty easy score, um, something to think about. Um, but yeah, there's there's constantly, you know, Spanish pork producers and Italian cheeses that are getting really angry about, you know, the lack of um, a green Nutri-Score on their foods. Thanks, Trish. I'm gonna, we're getting close to time. So I'm gonna leave uh, a minute for everyone uh, to, to to provide a, a last thought if they want while you're thinking about what that last thought will be i'll just uh gently remind everyone that there is one last panel uh in this series which will be held uh next uh tuesday april 12th uh at from the same time uh four to five edt and that is on u.s canada climate public opinion and urban climate governance uh, with the excellent uh, Christopher Bork, Eric LaChapelle, Sarah Hughes, and Brendan Boyd. Uh, really a very exciting panel as well. Um, so I will turn back over uh, to our presenters uh, to share their final thoughts. Uh, maybe I'll go uh, in backwards order this time. So uh, Trish, I'll start with you. So I think um, we're at this really pivotal moment where there seems to just be a convergence of a ton of different forces that make mostly plant-based diets, um, you know, the easy choice. Um, inflation in red meat has been the highest of any food category um, in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, so the evidence about colorectal cancer and other forms of chronic diseases from red meat just keeps on piling up year after year. And uh, the climate implications of red meat and dairy consumption are increasingly being spotlighted by the IPCC and other um, climate and environmental bodies. Um, but it is clearly a really tremendous uh, problem that has very little political interest in it. Um, I think if some of some of you may remember this, that a study actually from University of Michigan came out right at the beginning of the Biden administration um, that was talking about meat and climate, and it became a like sort of a social media phenomenon that Biden was trying to take away your hamburgers. And I think that sort of just sums up um, how difficult it is that like our national identities are very much tied in both countries um, with meat and dairy consumption, and that is going to be yeah a really difficult um, issue to solve. Thanks, Alan. Over to Barry. Energy methane, Heather, goes back to the point that you raised at the end of your opening. What is the future of natural gas and how do we think about it? On the one hand, reducing methane reduces impacts, but perhaps opens a path for continued use of natural gas. And yet, as we look at climate policy, as we look at European energy policy, the path to get to zero use and production of oil and gas is a very uncertain one, not just in North America. So the methane piece 
is part of that larger cell and conversation about how we we achieve these transitions. Thanks, and I'll turn over to Mark and Deborah for final thoughts. I'm just going to punt to Mark. Yeah, I, I think the, the the final thought for us just comes out of that that cluster approach at large and understanding that if we are going to make our way, you know, through this climate crisis with good structured and well mannered policy, there really is uh, not only like a need to cooperate, but also a serious amount of potential for uh, cooperation. And I, I think that as you know, or we think that as you know, the, the climate crisis presents this global commons problem, there is part of that that suggests that you need to have cooperation in order to get through it. The actions that states may take on their own will have the potential to mitigate uh, to an extent. But I think that there's, uh, or we think that there's a need to uh, picture this landscape as, as one of cooperation and not necessarily one of, of competition, because that will probably, or will hopefully lead to, a, you know, a, a much more constructive way about not only getting through this, but also the, the next steps to, to sort of take uh, after you've, you've hopefully handled some of the, the, the most damning parts of it. Well, thanks everybody and thank you everyone uh, for attending today. Uh, I hope you have uh, wonderful evenings and encourage you to again just register by check clicking on the uh, Ford School website uh, for that panel uh, next week. And yes, a huge uh, felicitations uh, on the achievement of these final reports. Uh, and again, encourage you all to read them. They are great reading. <laughs> Thank you.